Well, let's lift our hands to the Most High God and begin to bless His name. Let's give Him glory, give Him honor, give Him adoration. Worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Let Him hear your voice. Tell Him you love Him. Tell Him you appreciate Him. Give him all the glory, give him all the honor, give him all the adoration. Bless his holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we worship. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. of days the original majesty the I am that I am the unchangeable changer the creator of heaven and earth savior healer provider deliverer our hope of glory glory be to your holy name please accept our worship in Jesus name thank you for everything you've done since the beginning of the convention thank you especially for what you did yesterday Thank you in advance for what we yet do. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Today, in a very, very special way, visit your children. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. It seems you have forgotten what we learned yesterday. <laughs> so I remind you quickly, it, it says, when all the people praise him, then our God will bless us 
and the world will fear him. You are looking for fearful miracles. Shout hallelujah. God bless you. You may please be seated. Shake hands with one or two people. Tell them, God will surprise you tonight. I told you yesterday that when God asks you to clap your hands, It means put all your problems between your hands and jam the hands together. It also means, oh Lord, I will cooperate with you. So put your hands together for the Almighty God. Thank you, Father. Amen. Today, our text will be Second Timothy chapter two, from verse twenty to twenty-one. Second Timothy chapter two. From verse 20 to 21. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Yesterday we spoke on as pure as light. Today we want to talk about the power of sanctification. For those of you who are here, I told you one of the reasons we have conventions is so that we can dig deep because we are pilgrims on our way to heaven and we want to learn those things that will help us make it to heaven. When I was younger, soon as I became born again, I made my desire known to God. I don't want to be an ordinary Christian. I don't want to be an ordinary Christian. Is anybody here tonight who will say the same thing to God and say, Father, I don't want to be ordinary. He will grant your request in Jesus' name. 
When I said that, what I wanted was power. The power of the Holy Spirit. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. I want to see blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped, dumb speak, lame walk, dead rise. I want to be able to just wave my hand and miracles will happen. That's what I wanted. That's why, like I told you before, I studied Elijah, studied Elisha, studied Peter, studied Paul, and studied the Lord Jesus Christ himself very, very closely. I wanted power. And it wasn't long before I discovered that God is more interested in the fruit of the Holy Spirit than in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I soon discovered as it is written in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 21, Matthew 7, 15 to 21, that he said, by their fruits you shall know them, not by their gifts, by their fruits. I soon discovered as it's written in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 22 to 23 Matthew 7, 22 to 23 that you could have all the gifts you can perform miracles, signs and wonders and then on the last day God will say Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It is possible for you to be a world evangelist, raising the dead, opening blind eyes, doing mighty things. And then on the last day, he will tell the Almighty God, I, but I did all these things for you, and he said, I don't even know you. When I was younger, they taught us about what they call the three steps of faith. And they base it on Ezekiel 36 from verse 24 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 24 to 27. We call it salvation, sanctification, and Holy Spirit baptism. Actually, when I studied the scriptures closely myself. I found that there are actually four steps, not three. The step number one is selection. Because Jesus Christ himself said, no man can come to me except my father draws him. that you are here tonight can only be because God has drawn you. And for that alone, you should shout hallelujah. And 
when he has drawn you to the foot of the cross, then step two takes place, salvation. When the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sins. And then sanctification is supposed to follow. That's when God says, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Then and only then are you supposed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they call it steps of faith. Selection, salvation, sanctification, and baptism in the Holy Spirit. In those days, you are expected to have testified to the experience of salvation, sanctification, baptism in the Holy Spirit before you can sing in the choir. Now, salvation is easy to measure. When you are saved, it's not going to be long before people will notice. Your name will change. You begin to be called son of God. Daughter of God. Because the Bible says, to as many as believe him, to them give you power to be called sons of God. And suddenly you find that your friends who have been calling you by worldly names, Babake, Omanjaye Jaye, suddenly begin to say, uh, leave him alone. He's now a child of God. Your name will change. Your accommodation will change. When you are born again, it's not going to be long before you begin to attend church instead of club apps. Your former minister in the bar, the bartender, will discover he has lost a member of his congregation because now you go to church instead of going to the bar. I'm talking of those who got genuinely saved. Your responsibilities will change. Now you begin to witness for God. You won't be able to keep quiet. I'm talking of how it was when I was younger. I believe that's how it will be from now on. You begin to witness, you begin to talk about Jesus Christ. Instead of witnessing for the devil, instead of witnessing for the witch doctor, instead of saying last weekend, I met a herbalist who has swallowed the oracle. No, you begin to talk about People who got saved, people who got healed. I remember clearly when I got born again. 
It was on a Sunday night. Monday morning, as I got to my office at the University of Lagos, and I met my head of department, Professor Chikeobi of Blessed Memory. Good morning, sir. And I was just be about to begin to speak. I was, my, my, was one of the greatest mathematicians the world had ever known. But he was a tough man. And so the day he looked at me and said, I boy. I said, sir, I said, you look very cheerful this morning. You went to a party last weekend? I said, no, sir. But I've gotten an invitation to the greatest party of all. He said, which one is that? I said, I've gotten an invitation to the wedding of the Lamb of God. You can't keep it down. You can't keep it down. You can't be born again and keep it down. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's easy to see. Because if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. It is evident. It's the evidence that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, sanctification is difficult to measure because it's a matter of the heart. It's a change of heart. The heart of stone is replaced with the heart of flesh. When Somewhere along the line, I can't really pinpoint where it happened. People began to jump over sanctification. And they moved from salvation to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like salvation is the foundation of the house. Holy Spirit baptism is supposed to be the roof and sanctification is supposed to be the walls. But you know quite well it is possible to have a foundation dodge the walls and get to the roof. <laughs> like our auditorium here. So many Christians end up not even knowing what sanctification is all about. And when you ask them, are you sanctified? They say yes. And we don't have a way of measuring it. I mean, like, one young man had me speak on total surrender in Ilori. After the service came to me, Daddy, thank you for the, for the sermon. I surrender all. I said, really? He said, yes, sir. I said, good. Because he's the only other fellow in the church at that time who had a car. So I said, thank God that you have surrendered all. Tomorrow we are going somewhere and we need your car for the journey. He said, ah, but to do, tomorrow is Monday. I said, I know. He said, I need the car to go to the officer. I smiled. 
I said, we are not going anywhere tomorrow. I just want to show you, you have not surrendered anything. Sanctification cannot easily be measured because it's an eternal something. So many Christians end up speaking in tongues without going through the process of sanctification. Today I want to talk to you about the power of sanctification. I want you to please listen carefully because there are many of us who are not sanctified. You see, it is sanctification that makes living holy easy. Because your original heart, the heart you are born with, according to Jeremiah 17 verse 9, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, is desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says about it. He said your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The heart just wants to be wicked. It's as if its very existence depends on wickedness. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 verse 45, Luke 6 verse 45, it says, it is out of the abundance of this heart that the mouth speaks. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 19, Matthew 15 verse 19, he said, it is out of the heart that all evil thoughts proceed. Nobody commits adultery by accident. You think about it first. One man of God once said to me, Daddy, you are taking this thing too far. I mean, occasionally one will commit a sin without thinking about it. I say, is that so? I said, give me an example. He said, I mean, for example, one may not plan to commit a dot here, but he may just fall. I say, I see. When you are removing your clothes, what, what do you think you are trying to do? You want to go for a swim? <laughs> Don't let anybody deceive you. You sinned because you thought about it and decided about it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Proverbs 4, verse 23, it said, you must guide jealously, diligently, your heart. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. If it is the old heart, the one that is desperately wicked, out of it will come evil. That's why God says, the only way to help you is take away that stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. My prayer is that today, before this night is out, you will experience sanctification. Now to make it easy for you to swallow. Sanctification has another meaning. It means set apart 
for God's use. In the text that I read to you, it says in a big house. There are many vessels. Some to honor, some to dishonor. But he said it is the vessel that is sanctified that is made for the master's use, set apart for the master's use. When we say set apart, maybe one way that will make it easy for you to understand is to use the word favorite. To be sanctified is to become a favorite of God. Let me explain that one in a way that I, I hope God will make it easy for you to understand. In the olden days, a king is supposed to have many wives. Many. Many at times, not of their own choice. I mean, you want to befriend the king, you go and dash him, one of your daughters. And you in the scriptures, you find the example of Solomon, First Kings chapter 11, from verse 1 to 3. First Kings 11, verse 1 to 3. Solomon had 700 wives, plus 300 concubines. Now, when a king has many wives, uh, by the way, that will explain to you why palaces were big in those days with many rooms because each wife will have her own room with so many wives the royal majesty will not be able to minister to each wife adequately So several people help the king. I'm talking of the olden days, so. <laughs> oh Lord, have mercy on me. All oh, the royal fathers here, they are wonderful children of God. Let's give the Lord a big round of applause for all our royal fathers. <laughs> Glory be to God. So, the head of the army, the chief, herbalist, etc., etc., they help Kabiesi. But of all these wives, IBAC will have one that is favorite. In my language, they call her Ayo. Favorite wife. Nobody messes around with Ayo. You do so, you lose your head. The Ayo, the favorite wife, sleeps in the same room as the king. Please understand this. When you are sanctified, you become set apart for God. No demon 
No devil has the temerity to tamper with you because you are a favorite of God. You are a vessel unto honor. The power of sanctification is embedded in this unique intimacy with God. When you are truly sanctified, you have intimacy with God that other casual Christians don't have. For example, when you read Numbers 12, verse 5 to 8, Numbers 12, 5 to 8, God said, if there's any prophet among you and I want to speak to him I can talk to him in dreams I can talk to him in visions he said but Moses I talk to him mouth to mouth the first time I read that passage I thought I read it wrong I thought God was saying mouth to the ear. No, he said, I said mouth to mouth. A tremendous intimacy with the Almighty God. When you are sanctified, listen to me, my brothers. Because one of my children somewhere said to me, Daddy, we are not praying that you died soon. I said, even if you pray, God won't answer. He said, but we are getting older. Tell us some of these secrets. That's one of the secrets I'm telling you now. When you are truly sanctified, you begin to hear what others cannot hear. Take note of that. The favorite wife sleeps in the same room as the king. They have discussions in the bedroom that otherwise would not hear. Take John chapter 13 from verse 21 to 30. John 13, 21 to 30. The Lord was sitting down with the 12 disciples at a meal. He announced to them, one of you will betray me. And everybody will say, ah, who? Who can that be? Who will ever do such a thing? And the Lord wasn't answering. The Bible said, Peter turned to John, the disciple that Jesus Christ loved, the favorite among all of us, and said to him, ask him, if he won't tell anybody, he will tell you. Is that in the Bible? And so John said, Sir, who is the fellow? The Bible said Jesus didn't speak, didn't mention a name. He said back to John, I will show you the fellow. I will take a bit of bread, dip it in the soup, and put it in the mouth of the traitor. Jesus was sitting down with his disciples 
and two of them, himself and the favorite, were talking in codes. There are things, informations, that the Almighty God will only reveal to the sanctified. Some elderly people here who will remember years ago we had a Holy Ghost service at the stadium in Nevada. Had a wonderful night. All manners of miracles, signs, and wonders. And then it was about time to go home. And suddenly God spoke to me and said, There's a woman in the crowd under our armpits our feathers where hairs are supposed to be feathers call her out I want to set her free because every night the hair the feathers will grow before the husband will wake up she will quickly pluck them out but they will grow again the following night God said, call her forward. I, I, I said to Father Deef, please, we have had a wonderful time. Let's go home now. If I announce this, nobody is going to come out. And if you say somebody like that, he say, I know he's here. But stay there. Public glare. Announcement, and everybody was looking at me and wondering, has he gone mad? But she, she came forward, and when she came forward, I, she was a highly educated woman. I thought maybe she didn't understand what I said. She said, I "Got it right, sir." And God delivered her. Now I'm not saying. Amen. Go ahead. You can clap for the Almighty God. Now I am not saying, thus saith the Lord. I'm only saying this one as your father. In the name that's above every other name. That problem you have been hiding over the years will disappear tonight. When you are sanctified, because of the intimacy sanctification brings between you and God, you begin to know what others cannot possibly know. Take Moses that I mentioned just before. And just imagine how did Moses know what happened in Genesis chapter 1? Was, Jesus, was Moses alive then? No. But because of his intimacy with God, God told him in the beginning, Moses, before you ever came to this world, this is what I did. When you become a favorite of God, you begin to know what others cannot know.
for example. We had a testimony last month at the Holy Ghost service. A woman wanted to have a procedure with the doctors. I think for the fruit of the womb. The doctor said, how old are you? The lady said, 58. They said, ah, sorry. You're already three years too old. She came to the Holy Ghost service. As she was entering the auditorium, God said, there is someone here have reduced your age by five years. She said, ah, thank you, Lord. Following week, we went back to the doctor. And he said, doctor, I am only 53 years old now. <laughs> then the doctor laughed. You were 58 last week. You are 53 now. Why are you kidding? But the doctor went ahead with the procedure. And you were all here last month when she was raising the baby. How did the man of God know that somebody was just coming in with that peculiar problem? When you are sanctified, you begin to know what others cannot know. But what is most important in this issue of sanctification, the power of sanctification, is that if you are thoroughly, truly sanctified, you begin to see what others cannot see. You begin to see what had happened in the past. Like in Second King chapter 5. Verse 20 to 27, 2 Kings 5, 20 to 27. When Gehazi came in to Elisha, and Elisha said, uh -uh, Where have you been? He said, I didn't go anywhere. Ah, uh, you went somewhere. <laughs> I saw you. I saw you when you ran after the general. I saw you when the general turned around to meet you. I saw everything that happened. You begin to see what had happened. Things that there is no way you possibly could see. Nineteen seventy five at Adelabu Street in Surulere, where I was living. We were going for workers' meeting Sunday afternoon. And I went to the toilet to ease myself. As I sat on the toilet seat and I lifted up my eyes on the door. Of the toilet room, suddenly a screen appeared. And I began to watch as if we were watching a, a video. I saw his church service going on. Before long, I recognized it. Ah, uh, this is our church. At the Buddhist, that's the altar. And I was taken into the room, the vestry, leading to the altar. 
And in the vestry, there were two people praying, the pastor and the interpreter. And as I, watched them, as I was watching them pray, I was brought back into the church and somebody announced the, the, the hymn that will precede the sermon. And as they were singing the hymn that preceded the sermon, the pastor and the interpreter came in, took over the service, and fire fell. And the screen disappeared. When I got to the church that evening, I told my father in the Lord, Daddy, I saw something this afternoon. This, this, this is what I saw. My father in the Lord put his two hands on his head and, oh God, what happened? Then he called some pastors nearby, come, 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 they came. He said, I should repeat what I saw. And I told them and they all did the same thing. My father in the Lord said, years ago, at the beginning of the church, that's how we used to conduct service. The preacher and the interpreter will be praying while the service is on. They only come out when it's time to preach. But we stopped years ago. There was no way I could have known. <laughs> when you become sanctified, God could show you a picture of something that happened in your family years ago that is disturbing your present and show you how to deal with it. You can not only just see the past, you can see the present in a miraculous way. Second Kings chapter 6 from verse 8 to 12. Second Kings 6 8 to 12. A king wanted to wage war against the king of Israel. And as he's holding the meeting with his people, saying, This is where we are going to camp, and so on and so forth. God was showing everything to Elisha. And Elisha sent to his king and said, hey, this fellow is waiting for you there. Don't go that way. First time, second time, third time, accurately. So that the king of the enemy territory said, there must be a spy here. And one of the servants said, no, <laughs> there's no spy here. The one who is leaking your secret is in his prayer room. I can tell you several stories. If I tell you some of them, maybe some of you will be careful before you come to my office again. And you can then begin to see what is yet to happen. Second Kings chapter 7, from verse 1 to the end. Second Kings 7, from verse 1 to the end. At a time when the hardship was terrible, when people were, when women were beginning to eat their children, a man of God got up and said, Within 24 hours, there'll be more than sufficient food. Okay. You can go ahead and claim it as a prophecy. <laughs> and uh, believe, it, believe me or not, I also say amen. <laughs> Because uh, today is Wednesday, with the crowd here already, uh, 
and we are yet to even approach Friday and Saturday. The God of Elisha must must move. So that we have more than sufficient food. You can see into the future. Some of us will remember before coronavirus broke that God showed us we told many of you that the world is going to have a holiday I told you nobody could believe it until we began to see the whole of London all street deserted America it's all street deserted you can, you can see it to the future but that's not even the point the reason you must hunger for sanctification is because that might give you a the opportunity to have a glimpse of your house in heaven. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, if you can just catch a glimpse of heaven, you won't need any other sermon. If you see where you are going, <laughs> because it, it can be described. Second Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 2 to 5. Second Corinthians 12, from verse 2 to 5. Paul said, I know a man. Whether in the body or out of the body, say I can't tell. He was talking about himself. He said, I knew a man who was caught up to paradise. And what he saw there, he can't describe. And have several people who keep on saying, Sir, slow down. Don't you know you are getting old? I've seen where I'm going. I've caught a glimpse of heaven. Not yesterday. I've caught a glimpse of heaven when my father and the Lord was still alive. That's more than 40 years ago. You can see heaven. I remain the same. You can see heaven and cling to the things of the world. You can see heaven <laughs> and let any joker rob you of going there. May mention two little more points. I let the Holy Spirit teach you the remainder. Thorough sanctification is the actual secret of divine power. Thorough sanctification. That's the secret, the real secret of divine power. Why? Because God will not release massive power. 
to someone who cannot see the invisible. Second Kings chapter two, from verse nine to fifteen. Second Kings two, nine to fifteen. Elijah asked Elisha, "What do you want me to give you before I be taken away from you?" He said, "I want a double portion of your power." Ah, Elijah said. <laughs> What's wrong with you, boy? With a single portion that I have, I'm calling down fire at will. You want a double? He said, you are the one who asked me to ask. He said, okay then. If you see me, If you see the invisible, if you see <laughs> horses of fire, chariots of fire, see, because if you are not thoroughly sanctified, and God releases to you His awesome power, you get angry just once and destroy a lot of people. Elijah destroyed 50 soldiers and their captain twice. Elijah got double portion of the power. The devil recognized the fact. Here is, <laughs> here is another sanctified fellow. The king sent to arrest him an army. Just imagine what could have happened if Elisha got angry. Imagine. Now you want the power to raise the dead. Don't you know that the power to raise the dead can also be the power to kill? Some years ago, in a meeting of my boys, senior pastors in a particular country, one of the boys got up and began to talk to me. Loud and clear. What kind of man are you? I served you. I worked for you. Anytime you are coming to this country, I will be the one who will do this, who will do that. He kept on. All the others were trembling. What's wrong with this boy? Who is he talking to? When he finished, I smiled. I know what I could have done. <laughs> among my people, among the Yorubas, the worst thing you can do to a fellow is to begin to remind him. I'm the one who was feeding you. I'm the one who was clothing you. Uh, in Yoruba land, they call it Iregun. No Yoruba man can take that. I will ask you to tell me, tell me how much everything you've done for me costs. Tell me, tell me, I will pay you. I could easily have said that to my boy. Boy, you're talking to me? I'm supposed to be your dad. By the grace of God, I ordained you. 
I could have said, all right, all right. Sit down. Calculate everything you have ever spent for me. Calculate the interest. I will pay you double. But get out of this church. I could have done that and destroy his destiny. What did I do? My son, I'm very sorry. Please forgive me. Uh, I'll be more careful in the future. That evening, when I laid on my bed and I was reviewing the day, I just said to daddy, I didn't know I could take that too. <laughs> Thank you for sanctification. Finally, before you pray, ah, the favorite wife must be without blemish. The favorite wife is not supposed to make him a single mistake oh the favorite wife had tremendous powers she can determine the fate of other wives all she needs to do is to report any of them to KBAC and the wife is gone But she is not allowed to make a single mistake. Numbers chapter 20. Read it from verse 1 to 13. Numbers 20, 1 to 13. Moses, the favorite of God, was at the threshold of the promised land. And these people that he had been leading for 40 years, very troublesome people, anointed him again. And when God says, speak to the rock, he struck the rock God said ah Moses as close as we are by your action you dishonor me before these people you won't get to the land When we talk about total sanctification, the power of sanctification, it is like crucifix crucifixion. When you crucify somebody, he dies completely. When you are sanctified, if hunger, if hunger, anger is your problem, anger dies permanently. If uh, adultery is your weakness, it dies permanently. If lying, it's your problem. It dies. 
permanently. Paul said, Galatians chapter 2, you can read it from verse 20 down. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life I live now, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even the one alive anymore. That's a way somebody can talk about sanctification. When I release you to pray tonight, I hope nobody's going to disturb you. Put yourself on the cross and call on the Almighty God. Crucify me. Thoroughly. Absolutely. Anything that is not of God that I've been joking with in my life. Kill it once and for all. Sanctify me holy. Well, of course, before sanctification, there must be salvation. <laughs> Which means if you are not yet saved, you can't even be talking about sanctification. You must be saved first. That's why if you are anywhere in this auditorium, I'm going to wait. I'll be patient because this is crucial. You better come forward now and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. He has selected you for salvation. That's why he brought you here tonight. The next step is salvation. And the blood of Jesus Christ is available to wash away all your sins. It's only after you have been washed that you can then cry unto him for sanctification. So I'm going to count up to 20. If you are far away, you better begin to run now. So that you, are, you get here before I say 20. The rest of us will be clapping for the Almighty God, will be giving Him glory for the message that He has sent to us tonight. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, begin to come now. One. Two. Three. The blood washes white as snow. It's ready to forgive all your sins. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven.
Israel. Thirteen. As you come, begin to pray. Keep on crying to Jesus, asking him to save your soul. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Now, thank you very much. Those of you on the way, keep coming. But those of you already in front, cry to him, Lord have mercy on me. Save my soul. Wash me clean. I want to become as pure as light. Let your blood wash away all my sins today. I want to be yours. I'm not joking with salvation. I want you to save my soul. Please, Lord, save my soul. Make me a true child of God. Wipe away every sin I've ever committed. And I will serve you for the rest of my life. Save my soul, O oh Lord. Those of you on the way, just keep on coming. You are not late yet. Just keep on coming. And the rest of us, please, let's stretch our hands to all these people and intercede for them. Pray that the one who saved your soul will save their own souls also. Pray for them now. Intercede for them. Say, Lord God Almighty, have mercy on these your children. Save their souls, Lord. Please save their souls. Save their souls. Lord, save their souls. Hurry up, those of you who are still on the way. Hurry up. I want to pray for salvation now. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. My Father, my God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word. And thank you for these people who have come forward to surrender their life to you. Father, please receive them in Jesus' name. Amen. Have mercy on them. Let your blood wash away their sins. Save their souls today and write their names in the book of life. And let them become members of your family. From now on, any time they call on you, please answer them by fire. And let them serve you till the very end. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Now, I know some of you are still on the way. Keep coming. You are not late yet. Come and join those who have given their life to Jesus. And the counselors will collect your names, your address, and your prayer requests. And I promise you, by the grace of God, I'll be praying for you from now on. Now, the rest of us. The issue of sanctification is strictly between you and your God. Like I said, 
It might be difficult to measure. But when he has given you a heart of flesh, you will know it. So I want you to go to the Almighty God in prayer now and just cry unto him. Sanctify me, O Lord. Sanctify me completely. Give me a heart of flesh, Lord. I want to become your favorite. Go ahead. Cry unto the Almighty God. Stop to him. <laughs> 